Well, hello, guys. Welcome to an all new episode of Insights, which I hope by now is your scientific talk show of preference. And today uh, we have a very, very special guest uh, with whom I trust most of the uh, students in the field of psychology are familiar, Dr. Michael Dumgen. Uh, Dr. Dumgen is a professor of psychology at the University of Texas at Austin, where he has taught learning to undergraduate and graduate students since 1973. Uh, Professor Dumgen is noted for his functional approach to classical conditioning, which he has pursued in studies of sexual conditioning and taste aversion learning. Uh, Dr. Domjan served as editor of the Journal of Experimental Psychology, Animal Behavior Processes for six years and continues to serve on the board of uh, consulting editors for various journals in the United States, Colombia and Mexico. His textbook, Principles of Learning and Behavior, is available in both English and Spanish and has been used on five continents for more than a quarter century. Uh, Dr. Domjan is also a past president of the Pavlovian Society and also served as president of the Division of Behavioral Neuroscience and Comparative Psychology of the American Psychological Association. Dr. Domjan enjoys playing the viola and teaches a freshman signature course in music and psychology. He recently initiated the Tertis Pavlov project, which consists of a series of educational videos videos, I'm sorry, exploring connections between music and psychology. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Damjan, uh, thank you so much for being here with us. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you very much. Glad to, uh, glad to join you and uh, I'm glad to visit with uh, all of your, uh, your audience. Oh, thanks so much. Uh, I trust they will be very excited to learn a little bit more about your career and your research interests. And uh, one of uh, one of the questions that I uh, often ask uh, the people I interview is, uh, how do they come to the field uh, to their current field of study? So, uh, what about if you tell us a little bit more about how you came to studying psychology and becoming a researcher in this area? Uh, well, it, it it wasn't a difficult. Uh... Uh, difficult uh, path. <laughs> when um, I was in high school, I, um, I learned about this special program uh, that was uh, uh, conducted by the National Science Foundation in the United States, uh, which uh, provided uh, uh, accelerated enriched uh, instruction for uh, selected uh, high-performing high school students uh, in various topics at various uh, colleges and universities around the, the country. And these were programs that were run during the summer. Uh, and uh, there was a program in uh, behavior analysis uh, uh, that was conducted at uh, Grinnell College in Iowa. I was living in New Jersey at the time. And uh, this uh, 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 looked interesting, so I applied and uh, I was accepted into the program. And so um, uh, it's been eight weeks, uh, I think it was eight weeks, <laughs> See, maybe six, uh, in a pretty intensive training program in, in uh, behavior analysis uh, and related issues in uh, psychology of learning. Uh, I became so fascinated with the topic that uh, I can't return the next year uh, as uh, to help uh, help run run the program. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, once uh, I went, uh, I ended up going to Grinnell College <laughs> as my undergraduate school. Mm -hmm and continued to work as a member of the staff of this uh, training pro high school training program during the summers. Uh, the training program was called the Behavior Science Institute. And now uh, one of the remarkable uh, things about this uh, is that um, they brought in visiting scientists uh, and there were lots of these visiting scientists and they became 
some of the most prominent people in uh, establishing the field of applied behavior analysis. Hey, For example, uh, Jack Michael was one of the uh, uh, resident instructors, uh, Nate Azrin, who uh, uh, subsequently became a very prominent uh, uh, person in applied behavior. He, he was there every summer. Uh, Murray Sidman was there um, most summers. And uh, uh, so I got to uh, interact with and get to know and get to hear uh, what some of these uh, great scientists had to say and uh, uh, some of my relationships with these folks uh, lasted for decades afterwards. Uh, I remember uh, uh, talking to Jack Michael uh, at a conference, you know, several decades later, but uh, you remembered who I was, uh, Murray Sidman, uh, met at conferences. Anyway, it was a wonderful experience and it, uh, it uh, launched me in a career on uh, focusing on conditioning and learning uh, with uh, some of the most prominent scientists in the field. So it, 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 it's kind of a, uh, uh, it's an unusually, uh, not many people have this kind of opportunity. It's really a, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And here I am doing this line of work. Uh, uh, some 50 years later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, definitely seems like a uh, very, very interesting uh, introduction to the field of behavior analysis. And of course, uh, having met a lot of colleagues who, who went on to develop such uh, important uh, concepts and studies and uh, well, in general, uh, apportations, apportations, I don't know if that's a word, <laughs> but well, to the field of perhaps. applications, okay, to the field of, of psychology. Uh, Dr. Domjan, I would also like to know, maybe if, if you could tell us a little bit more about another of your uh, interests, which is music and how you came to uh, start playing a uh, music instrument and uh, in general, this interest of yours. Well, uh, that uh, that goes back a bit further. <laughs> I was uh, born in Hungary, and uh, uh, in the United States, and I suspect Mexico, the most popular musical instrument is the guitar. Yeah. In Hungary, the most popular instrument is the violin. So if you walk around Budapest, there are people carrying violin cases everywhere. And my grandfather uh, was not a prof professional musician. He was an amateur musician, but he loved to play the viol violin. Uh, and uh, my grandmother accompanied him on the piano. And that was an important part of their relationship. And so uh, when I was growing up in Budapest, my grandfather started to teach me how to play the violin. And uh, when it, uh, uh, we left Hungary during the revolution in 1956, uh, the only thing that, that I could take with me was what would fit into a backpack. <laughs> uh, so I put some clothes, change, a, change of underwear, <laughs> and my violin. <laughs> my violin mm -hmm. was in, in my backpack, and uh, we, uh, we uh, uh, left Hungary and uh, spent a year in Switzerland and then set, settled in the United States. The, the next part of the story is also kind of a Cinderella type of story. We were living on the west side of New York, Manhattan, and uh, I was, uh, I have a twin brother who also played the violin as well as a sister. And uh, my mother was on uh, riding the bus on Broadway and she looked out the window and she saw a building which said Juilliard School of Music. And so she got off the bus and she walked, went into the went into the building and said, hey, I've got a couple of kids who uh, need music lessons. <laughs> Could they come here to study? And uh, my brother and I ended up in uh, in a preparatory division of the Juilliard School of Music, 
uh, in uh, about 19, starting in about 1950, late 57, 58, and, uh, and I, uh, I continued to take music lessons there uh, for the next six years. Uh, at one point, I switched from the violin to the viola, and that's where I learned to play the viola. Wow. <laughs> Who would have guessed that uh, you ended up in Juilliard just uh, because of like this coincidence, right? Well, like your mother. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, it, it was a total coincidence. Yeah. yeah. Well, but that that's so great. It's uh, such an interesting and wonderful story. So, uh, Dr. Domjan, if it's okay, uh, uh, I would like, like to talk about uh, one of your main research interests, which is uh, Pavlovian conditioning. Uh, Maybe uh, I know that uh, you have studied this with regards to many applications. And uh, I have the impression that uh, maybe even uh, within the behavior analysis uh, people, uh, classical conditioning uh, does not get uh, all the attention or uh, maybe it is often overlooked in favor of other learning processes. Uh, Could you tell us a little bit more about how uh, Pavlovian conditioning plays uh, a role in the complex human repertoire of human behaviors? Uh, well, I, uh, you're absolutely correct uh, that Pavlovian conditioning doesn't get a great deal of attention in the field of applied behavior analysis. And I think that is very unfortunate. And uh, that's because Skinner didn't have much respect for Pavlovian conditioning. And, and uh, he essentially told his students, don't worry about it, it's not important. It only ha is only relevant to glandular responses like salivation. Yeah. Uh, And Skinner was interested in voluntary behavior, in, in behavior that involved interacting with the environment where the subject had to do something in order to change the environment. The whole uh, the term operant behavior, which is very uh, commonly used in uh, uh, Skinnerian learning uh, analyses, operant behavior is behavior that operates on the environment and uh, salivation doesn't operate on the environment <laughs> in that in that in that kind of direct sense and so skinner skinner uh, relegated pavlovian condition to very much a second class status yeah. yeah and i think that was a huge mistake and and we have not recovered from that uh, to this day in fact if i live long enough <laughs> one of the papers I would like to write is uh, what uh, beha applied behavior analysis has missed out on because they've ignored Pavlovian conditioning. Yeah. Uh, Pavlovian conditioning is inescapable. It's a part of everything that you do from the minute you get up in the morning till you go to bed. I mean, if you had breakfast this morning, that was a Pavlovian conditioning trial. Uh, if uh, uh, you, you walked outside and you made predictions about whether it's going to be cold or it's going to be warm, yeah, you made those predictions based on cues that were previously associated with warm weather or windy weather or cold weather. So we're constantly making predictions. We are, uh, it, it, if you couldn't predict uh, what was going to happen next, it would, you would be very uncomfortable. <laughs> it would be very, I mean, if you ask me a question, what are you predicting? Well, you're predicting that I'm going to answer. Yeah. If you ask me a question and all of a sudden I jumped up in the air and did a flip backwards, uh, you would be fairly surprised. And uh, if you couldn't uh, rely on uh, what was going to happen next after you posed the question to people, it, it, communication would be impossible. So 
predicting the future, <laughs> predicting what happens next is a critical part of uh, um, smooth interaction and, and effortless, effortless navigation of the environment. And all those predictions are based on past experience. Yep. They're based on uh, stimuli that in the past have been followed by certain events and, and stimuli that, have, uh, you know, will never be followed by certain events. So you, you can predict what will happen yep. and you can predict what is for sure is not going to happen. And all, both of those kinds of predictions are very important in uh, making it easier for us to uh, interact with the environment. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, and in this sense, uh, Pavlovian conditioning works, uh, or well, serves uh, as, as a mechanism to shape our expectations, right? So uh, we can live fairly organized lives as opposed to uh, chaotic lives because uh, we cannot predict what, uh, when something is going to happen, right? Yes, yes, indeed. It And uh, one of the things I've been most fa really fascinated with uh, is uh, this kind of prediction is, is built into language so that when you say certain words, the probability of what the next word is going to be becomes much more limited. It's, it's, it's like the next word is not selected from the total possible vocabulary of that language. The next word is selected from a possible two or three or, or five alternatives. And you see this when you, uh, when you try to write a text message uh, with your phone. If you write a text message with your phone, you, you, put, uh, you write the first word yeah. and your phone gives you suggestions about what the next word ought to be. And uh, uh, those suggestions are based on predicting what the next word is likely to be based on the previous one. That uh, I've been amazed at how accurate that program is. Sometimes I've been able to write an entire sentence without typing new words, just speak. It picked up home and on the way. <laughs> I mean, it, it was amazing. So uh, uh, this sort of uh, predictability is built into language, and that's what enables us to read. When we're reading, yeah, we, uh, we encounter one word, and the next word is not. We don't predict the next word from a possibility of two thousand words in a language we predict it based on the context of the previous word and so we have a very sh and uh, learning uh that structure of the language makes us much easier for us to read so and and so predictability is built into it it's amazing it's really i mean, I mean it, it's it, it it's so much a part of our lives that uh Uh, finding a situation where the next event is not predictable, that's really hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would definitely be quite chaotic if we couldn't know uh, what's uh, the most probable thing that will happen next. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so... Uh, I would also uh, love to know uh, how Pavlovian conditioning uh, influences our likes and dislikes. I've heard of uh, like this term of evaluative conditioning and uh, I've read that some people consider it classical conditioning, some people like give it a separate uh, category. Ha uh, how, what do you think about this or how Pavlovian conditioning can shape our likes or preferences? Uh, it... I think uh, Pavlovian, I use the term Pavlovian conditioning fairly broadly to refer to associations, linkages between two stimuli. I mean, in Pavlov's paradigm, it was uh, you know, visual cues paired with food. Uh, but uh, any two events can become linked or associated. 
And once that happens, the first stimulus activates the memory of the second stimulus. And uh, uh, this kind of process, of course, generates behavior uh, in response to the first stimulus that's uh, appropriate to the unconditioned or second event. And, uh, and a behavior can be a glandular response, as in conditioned salivation. It can be a skeletal response in that uh, you will approach stimuli that signal uh, the availability of food, for example. Um, uh, and it can be an emotional response. Uh, very early on, you know, Pavlov didn't uh, do experiments on this, but uh, uh, very early on, uh, 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 John Watson did uh, fear conditioning in uh, in an infant uh, yeah. by the name of little Albert uh, to uh, condition fear uh, to uh, a, a white rabbit. Uh, so it, it the the uh, association can result in an emotion being evoked or elicited by the conditioned stimulus and we can experience a range of emotions i mean certainly conditioned there's a lot of work on conditioned fear uh there is less work uh on conditioned preference where you learn to like something and prefer an item because of its association with a positive uh, experience. And uh, I think essentially that's what evaluative conditioning is. Evaluative conditioning is, uh, is the learning of an emotional response to the first stimulus because it has been become associated with a with a second event, uh, be it positive or negative or uh, whatever emotion. So I, I think about evaluative conditioning as a, 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 a special case of Pavlovian conditioning where the focus is on preference and liking. Uh, so what the focus, what the, for me, uh, delineates evaluative conditioning is the behaviors that you're measuring. You know, if Pavlov, if he had not measured uh, salivation, but he had measured how much the dogs came to like, like or prefer uh, the visual cue that was paired with food, uh, then it, uh, it it would have been an example of evaluative conditioning. <laughs> Okay. It changed the emotional value of the stimulus. Now, Pavlov didn't measure these uh, preferences, and uh, so we don't have information about it, but I'm sure any uh, conditioning procedure in which you have a strong unconditioned stimulus that you strongly enjoy or strongly uh, dislike is mm -hmm. going to condition emotions to the condition stimulus that correspond to the U.S. Okay, okay, I get it. Uh, it all adds up in the end to the learning processes involved uh, when the association is then uh, between two stimuli. Yes. So, uh, Doctor, I mean, one of the things that uh, one of the things that I've been <laughs> curious about, if you ask people. Uh, what is their favorite color? Mm -hmm. uh, my granddaughter uh, has absolutely n no trouble naming her favorite color. And most people don't have trouble naming their favorite, which means that you like this particular color. Now, where did that come from? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not that the color is inherently likable. <laughs> Uh, I suspect uh, you learn to like a color because of its association with something in your past experience. Now, we don't know in, mo in most cases what that might have been, um, but uh, we express 
likes and dislikes for virtually anything. And a lot of it, it doesn't, is not based on unconditioned properties of these objects. It's, so it must be conditioned. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it becomes quite interesting since uh, consciousness about learning is not a requisite, right, for uh, Pavlovian conditioning. So it can occur even if we are not aware of it. I'm, well, I think the correct word is awareness rather than consciousness. That's right. Yeah. A lot of uh, these associations occur uh, below the level of conscious awareness. That's right. Yeah. And uh, well, that's so interesting. I was wondering if you could uh, tell us some examples of how uh, classical conditioning uh, processes are found in the when you wish to examine, for example, the uh, behaviors related to musical performance? Uh, okay, well, um, music is very complicated. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, I would get to. But um, one of the things about, so uh, we're talking about likes and dislikes. Mm -hmm. uh, just like, as with color, if you ask somebody what's your favorite music, people have no trouble tell, telling you. Or what's your favorite musical artist? Yeah. They tell you right away. So uh, I think musical likes and musical dislikes are probably established through Pavlovian associations, uh, through the kind of mechanisms we talk about in evaluative conditioning. So one way in which uh, Pavlovian conditioning is relevant to music is to shape our emotional response uh, to music. But another uh, uh, way in which Pavlovian associations enter into it is, um, you know, we were talking about how uh, in reading or writing, mm -hmm. You use one word to predict what the next one is. Exact same thing occurs in music. In music, uh, if, if, if I played a series of notes such that you could not predict what the next note will be, uh, you would not find that pleasant whatsoever. <laughs> if, it, if, if musical notes show up Un, uh, unpredictably, uh, it sounds chaotic and you don't like it. Uh, most pieces of music have a set rhythm, you know, they're in three quarter time or four quarter time or two quarter time. And so one of the things that you, as soon as you've heard a small section of that piece of music, one of the things you learn to predict is where the downbeat is. Is it one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, or is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, three, four. And so, so uh, you, the, the rhythm becomes highly predictable. If I pull out an instrument and you see that it's a flute, you immediately predict what kind of sounds it's going to make, <laughs> right? You know, it's not going to be a guitar, a guitar type sounds. It's not going to be a, 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 the sound of a bow going across the string. So uh, just like one word limits the possible range of other words you're going to use or see, uh, the instrument uh, sets constraints on the sound. And then once you start playing a piece of music, uh, it's in a particular key, maybe G major or C major or B minor or whatever. Well, what that means is that the, the notes that are used to compose that piece of music are not all the possible notes that the instrument can play, but uh, B minor, for example, every time you hit the B, it has to be stepped down a half step to be a B flat. Or no, no, it's not B minor. Minor doesn't refer to flats. 
anyway you know what i mean each key uh each key signature uh, cons uh gives you a restricted set of notes and um so uh, once you start playing a piece of music you learn to predict what you often predict what the next note is going to be so much so that someone who has never heard that piece of music can tell you if the performer plays a wrong note yeah what's the wrong note well it's a note that came at the wrong time or it's a note that is the wrong pitch given the melodic development that preceded it so um learning these predictabilities is uh is critical to musical enjoyment I mean, one of the fascinating things for that 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 uh, I've been curious about is you go to a, a, a concert with, let's say, a guitar player singing songs, mm -hmm. and it's a famous artist, and um, people people who go to uh, that performance are familiar with the songs that this artist has recorded, and and. So you go to this performance and I've been to performances like this where people sing along yeah. with, with the performer and they know every song yeah. that the performer plays that night. So there's nothing unpredictable <laughs> yeah. for them in that experience. They know exactly what the next part of the lyrics is going to be, what the next part of the melody is going to be. They know everything about what's coming up. And they learn, learn those uh, to predict uh, uh, the, uh, all those things uh, based on associations and, and past experience listening to those songs. So these sort of this associative structure, I think, is, is uh, very much a part of uh, of how music is uh, composed and how music is enjoyed. Yeah. So, well, uh, and it actually uh, is something that we all can relate to, I think, right? Because uh, maybe we evolved into a concert of we all know, uh, I'm sure everyone has found like uh, this uh, kind of mistake when someone is playing uh, the key, right? And it's interesting to know that this is something that we learn to identify. I yeah, thought. yeah. So talking that, about that, this sort of thing, I mean, we, we were talking about favorite colors. Yeah. Uh, another thing that uh, everybody has, uh, has no trouble uh answering is what's your favorite song yeah uh, or uh, they they readily tell oh i love that song yeah. and then you uh, uh ask them other questions about well what's the first time you heard it who was there with you and the circumstances under uh, that surrounded the uh first uh, experience of that song and you find that if, if, if it's a favorite song These were wonderful circumstances. You were with your best friend, or it was the first date with the woman you married, and so forth and so on. Yeah. I just thought about uh, how some specific types of music might uh, be specially heard, uh, maybe in some contexts that involve uh, maybe drugs of abuse and if uh, I'm sure classical conditioning plays a huge role here. Yes, Just... indeed. I mean, we have uh, songs that are called religious songs. Yeah. Well, why, why do we call them religious songs? Because we usually hear them in a church. Yeah. And, uh, so there's an association between those melodies and the context where you hear them. And uh, 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 the context can be the context of, uh, of uh, drug being uh, under the influence of a drug or other. And so that then becomes associated with that. Yeah. Song. Oh, that's definitely quite interesting. So, Dr. Domjan, I have a question that uh, may help me introduce, uh, uh, well, further questions, uh, which is. Uh, 
what are some interesting uh, maybe neuroscientific findings regarding music or uh, regarding musicians and the difference between lay people or musicians that uh, play different instruments i think there is there is a lot to say about that uh, with regards to the human brain uh there is a lot that uh, people have been fascinated uh, with uh, concerning the neuroscience of music uh, i hate to say this but uh, i'm not so impressed that this this uh, type of work has uh, given us deeper insights into musical experience I mean, if uh, one of the things that you'll notice if, if you study uh, how the brain processes musical stimuli is that a lot of the brain is involved. Particularly if you uh, uh, do a neuroimaging of a musician. If you do neuroimaging while a musician is listening to a piece of music that he or she has actually played. Uh, what what parts of the brain are activated? Well, everything is activated. Yeah. I mean, there are motor areas that are involved in actually playing that piece of music, and that are activated when you hear the music. Uh, uh, there are, of course, memory areas because you remember uh, this piece of music. Of course, there's sensory areas. The auditory cortex, in in, uh, in many ways, uh, is, is activated. So there are a lot of different parts of the brain that are activated, but we know that <laughs> without doing brain imaging. Yeah. <laughs> so, what does brain imaging add that we don't know? Well, uh, one of the uh, major findings. Uh, has been that uh, musical training may actually rewire the brain, and uh, that's 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 pretty fascinating. And exactly how does that rewiring occur? And in, uh, initially, uh, data to this effect was obtained by comparing the brains of expert musicians mm -hmm. with the brains of people who were not expert musicians and so it's a between group kind of comparison and uh, it's very difficult to get the right control group in that kind of experiment but uh, okay you look at expert musicians how are, is how is their life different and life history <laughs> different from people who are not expert musicians? Well, expert musicians have spent a lot of time practicing. Yeah. And all of that practice was done, most of it's done by themselves <laughs> in social isolation. Yeah. So they have to, uh, they had to learn how to regulate their own behavior and set goals and and persevere uh, if you don't get it right the first time, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And yeah. it's 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 like we're uh, in the, if to become an Olympic skater, you have to be skating f five or six hours a day as you're growing up as a as a child. That makes you a very different child <laughs> yeah. than somebody who doesn't become an expert skater. For one thing, you have to have supportive parents. You know, you can't, uh, an, an expert musician uh, can't get to that level of expertise without having parental support to pay for the lessons to, uh, or other kinds of social support. Well, does your control group, do those kids have that same level of social support? People don't ask these kinds of questions. 
So uh, these comparisons are kind of difficult. I mean, more recently, uh, uh, they've started doing actual experiments where they take one group of kids and they give them musical training and another group of kids doesn't. And, and in, 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 uh, they try to equate the uh, characteristics of those two groups. Uh, and that's a much better kind of experiment. Um, yeah, it's, it's more like a prospective design, right? Yeah, it's more prospective and it's experimental. It's you're yeah. not looking at natural variations and you can equate your experimental group with your control group on factors like how much time do they sp Well, you have to equate them on how much time do they spend practicing? Well, yeah. then your control group has to practice something else. <laughs> yeah. And then you have to decide, well, what are they going to practice? Uh, and so on. So these, I, this is very difficult uh, area in which to do a, a, a really good experiment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, like most uh, experiments in human behavior are quite complex and uh, require a lot of uh, rigorous uh designs yes but I, I i think people i'm not comfortable with how quickly people jump to conclusions based yeah. on uh, on this kind of research i i'm more inclined to be much more skeptical yeah dr dobjen uh in well in my experience in Latin America and Spain also, uh, there's like this big quarrel between like uh, behavior analysts and uh, the field of neuroscience, uh, which I think uh, shouldn't be as, uh, maybe uh, there shouldn't be a fight at all. It's more like a, a thing of uh, limiting uh, or, or uh, defining uh, the, the research questions and the field of study, what is your opinion regarding uh, behavior analysis and neuroscience in terms of uh, how they can help each other uh, rather than be separate fields or uh, things that must be uh, fighting all the time? Well, I, I think um, this conflict between neuroscience and behavior analysis that you're talking about is another unfortunate uh, legacy of Skinner's own personal opinions. Okay. Uh, Skinner was very anti-brain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he didn't think you needed to study the brain. Uh, and he, he was very anti-brain and, and uh, elaborated on his reasons for that. And at the time, focusing on behavior made a lot of sense because the neuroscience techniques that were available were really crude. They were, uh, and, and uh, so it, there wasn't a great deal of insight you might get. Uh, although, you know, physiological psychology is what it was called at the time. Uh, it did make some significant progress in a number of areas. Uh, it didn't uh, make much progress on learning. I mean, although there were some quite significant findings in neuro, uh, the physiological psychology of memory. Well, we live in a totally different world. <laughs> we, uh, yeah. we live in a totally different world than Skinner in 1953 when he wrote Science and Human Behavior. Yeah. You know, that was 70 years ago. 70 years is uh, what, seven or eight generations of students. Yeah. Uh, and uh, technology and uh, available techniques for studying the neurobiology of behavior. That has uh, there been tremendous progress in, in, uh, in those uh, uh, domains. So there are techniques that people didn't even dream about being uh, possibly yeah. used uh, 70 years ago. So we're in a totally different world and uh, we should not be constrained by what Skinner thought about these things, no matter how great as an eminent psychologist that he was, 
he couldn't see 70 years into the future. And so if he were alive today, and if he were a student today, I bet you he would come to very different conclusions. And, and we have to, uh, we have to be the students of today, not the students of 70 years ago. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. And uh, this question uh, came from uh, my own experience, since uh, my research interests are in psychophysiology. It's often a, uh, a field that it's, well, by nature in the middle of neuroscience and uh, behavior analysis. And they, these are some kinds of uh, concerns that I am uh, encountered with on a daily basis. So uh, I, I, I wanted to know you, I wanted to know your opinion regarding this, but uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's a very interesting insight, right? Because, uh, well, we, we, we shouldn't be trapped uh, in the ideas of 70 years ago. Yeah, that's right. I think that's that's my main point. <laughs> Don't be trapped by yeah. what Skinner thought 70 years ago. He wouldn't think those things today if you were starting out. Yeah. Dr. Dumjet, I, I, I don't want to take a lot more of your of your time, which you uh, have uh, given us a lot of uh, great insights regarding uh, psychology and music. But I would like to ask you two questions, uh, which would be kind of an advice to uh, both two people, uh, well, all people, which is why should they care about learning to play a music instrument or uh, help their kids learn to play a music instrument? <laughs> why should you care or uh, encourage people to play a musical instrument? Well. Uh, I don't have any uh, professional advice on this one. Yeah. <laughs> and I can tell you that um, I tried to get my grandson to uh, learn to play the violin. And I took him to lessons and, mm -hmm. and I was totally unsuccessful. And <laughs> he'd much rather play baseball, uh, much rather to play sports. And so actually one of the... <laughs> videos that I I have uh, up on YouTube uh, uh, ask the question, why is it uh, harder to teach somebody to play the violin than to teach them to play baseball? <laughs> uh, and I, I mean, often we, so as a parent, uh, you have to have a, re a good relationship with your kids and to force them to do something they really don't want to do <laughs> is not going to help your relationship. <laughs> so so I'm, uh, I, I, I surrender that not every kid is going to be interested in learning to play a musical instrument. Uh, if I think there are, uh, you know, I, my life uh, would be a, a lot uh, um, uh, less interesting if I did not play a musical instrument. So this has been very important for me and I wouldn't give it up for the world. But uh, obviously, uh, and this is not for everybody. An interesting, uh, a, 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 a real interesting question is why some kids are just not interested in learning to play the violin. Well, the violin is very difficult to learn to play. So, yeah. because you have to create the notes, uh, much more difficult than, than the guitar, where the notes are kind of given to you by the frets. Okay. So, if I uh, uh, if I were to start from scratch, I would pick an instrument where that where you don't have to create the notes, like uh, piano, yeah, or a guitar. And uh, then at least the notes are there, and then you can uh, concentrate your instruction on uh, rhythm and melody and harmony, and so, you know, other elements of, of uh, music. Okay. And the second question I wanted to ask uh, is uh, considering that our well, the audiences uh, consist of a great, in great part, of uh, psychology students. 
what would you advise them uh, if you if you could pick uh, one advice for for all psychology students regarding their professional life or their professional development well uh, if there's one, one piece of advice never stop learning yeah it's uh, don't think you know it because there is always more to more to learn <laughs> There's always ways to know it better. And if after, even after you graduate, you need to keep learning. I keep learning every day. I, yeah. I'm constantly uh, scanning the literature, finding articles I need to read, and uh, uh, just keep on learning. It, uh, it's, it's, uh, Psychology is, it, it, it's not like you're ever finished. <laughs> you're never yeah. finished being a student. Uh, I mean, I admire students who are interested in this topic. Of course, uh, a, a big issue is how are you going to make a living uh, based yeah. on, uh, on on your knowledge. Uh, and that's difficult or and ch can be challenging and depends on you know your local circumstances and where you live and so forth i think uh, uh applied behavior analysis has provided a lot of jobs for people yeah because uh treatment of autism spectrum disorder and various developmental disabilities there there is no real alternative to applied behavior analysis Uh, so that's a, a good way to try to make a living. Uh, but even if you do that, you're not fully trained when you start out doing that. Keep on learning. Keep on learning. There's always going to be something else to yeah. help you out. Definitely. That's a that's a great piece of advice and, uh, and one I... Uh, at least I always tell my students that they, that they should never be, uh, they should never think that all is known because there's always some more uh, things to know. Well, Dr. Damjin, thank you so much for uh, this wonderful time and for your talk. Uh, if you're okay with it, I will leave here in the description of the video the links to both of your channels, the one where you talk about learning, uh, which I think uh, people will be very, well, but will be very interesting for people who want to uh, deepen in this understanding of learning mechanisms, but also to the Turtis Pavlov project, so they can learn a little bit more about how psychology and music are intertwined. Thank you. Thank you. That would be great. And well, it's been a pleasure to uh, visit with you and to all the students out there. I wish you the best of luck in, uh, in your future career. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dumjan. Have a great day. You too. Take care.